Well, obviously, I think Undertaker has the bigger one. I think that one's, uh, you know, his win streak at WrestleMania has obviously gone on to be a major attraction for WrestleMania in of itself and just seems to grow bigger and bigger every year, you know, the bigger the streak gets. Whereas Goldberg was more of a... Um, it was more of a short-term thing. I mean, they got about a year out of it, and then once the streak was over, it was over. Uh, so in the long term, I think The Undertaker has obviously proven to be the bigger streak. But uh, in the short term, and while it was on, I was very entertained by Goldberg's rise to the top. I really got sucked into the whole Goldberg phenomenon. And I think overall, I probably enjoyed uh, Goldberg's streak a little bit more, because it became a great weekly thing to turn into, as opposed to The Undertaker's streak, which... Uh, um, you know, it really depends on the match itself, whether or not it's actually interesting. I mean, if they put Undertaker up against, say, Mark Henry, I'm not going to give a shit, which they actually did one year. Or put him up against Boss Man, I'm not going to give a shit. Uh, and you run that risk of doing that. You know, the streak doesn't automatically make something interesting, but Goldberg's streak, uh, because it was a week-to-week -week thing, every single match was interesting. And each match was exciting, and it became a fun thing. It's like, all right, how's Goldberg going to kill this fucker this week? Uh, so, uh, overall, short term, I enjoyed Goldberg's more, but in the grand scope of things, The Undertaker's is obviously a lot bigger. I consider the Attitude Era to be exclusive to the WWF, that's obviously the term that they invented. Uh, if I were going to assign a name to the entire thing encompassing all three companies, WCW, ECW, and WWF, I would probably call it the Era of the Big Three, or maybe the Monday Night Wars Era, even though ECW didn't have a Monday Night Show, but, you know, that, that's probably how I would look at it if I were going to encompass all three, but to me, the Attitude Era is exclusive to the WWF. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the NWO era of WCW was very PG. It was, it, you know, it wasn't abundantly violent as far as, like, absolutely gruesome and graphic. It wasn't overly sexual. There wasn't a whole lot of cursing. It was very PG, but it was edgier, it was more intelligent, and it had an air of realism to it that a lot of wrestling products didn't have at the time. Uh, so, you know, I often cite, uh, you know, 96 and 97 WCW as an example of, you know, PG is fine, it's stupid that bothers me. You know, PG is not an excuse to be stupid. You can do a great wrestling show if it is PG, and I think WCW, at the height of its popularity and at its creative height, is proof of that. Oh, I have no earthly idea what they would have done if they hadn't sold it to Vince McMahon. It was just obvious to me that they just wanted to get rid of it. And, you know, they had no interest in continuing it. And maybe they would have auctioned it off. I don't know. But it, it was, you know, whatever the case was, it was very clear that all they wanted to do was just get rid of it and just be done with it. Oh, I don't know. That, that sounds like something WCW would have done in the early 90s. It just... Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't see the appeal in it, quite honestly. And, you know, if you're doing anything Civil War themed uh, and you have a Southern side, they're pretty much automatically going to be the heels, I would imagine, because so many people associate the South with, uh, you know, slavery. I, I, you know, reading up on the Civil War, I don't believe it was as cut and dry as that, as black and white, you know, North good, South bad. Uh, it was, uh, but a lot of people do view it that way. And, uh, I, I don't know, I just don't think it would be a very good idea to do it. I, I don't see it clicking, I don't see it working. And it, it would probably come off as really cartoonish as well. Uh, and, you know, yeah, I, I just don't think it would be that good of an idea. I have. I, I couldn't tell you any specific titles because I'm not a major kung fu movie fan. Uh, but I've seen a couple of Bruce Lee's movies. He was cool, you know, looked great. But not a major fan. I'm articulate? Sorry to say, no I haven't. You know, it's funny, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine and first words out of his mouth was, you know what, I think George Lucas is dying. And uh, you know what, uh, the second he said that, the first thought that popped in my head was, you know what, Jim Henson was in the process of selling the Muppets to Disney right before he died. So that's always kind of made me wonder, is did Henson know something that he was going to die and just wanted to make sure that his creation was in good hands? I, I, I don't know. Um, 
With that said, uh, you know, I hope everything's okay with George. I, I don't hold any animosity towards him. He did give me the original trilogy, so and Indiana Jones. So for that, you know, God bless you. Um, as for putting it in the hands of Disney, uh, I think it could be a good thing. I think it could be something to kind of, you know give new life to the franchise and possibly spark it into something decent again. I, you know, I don't know. Obviously, I think a lot of, you know, most of us weren't very high on the prequels. I'm, I've been happy with the Clone Wars cartoons, personally. Um, but as far as doing a new movie, I, I thought they were pretty much done. I, was, I never envisioned there being a 7, 8, and 9 um, after there was so much disappointment over 1, 2, and 3. Um... I mean, you know, with new creative minds behind it, and as long as they do something well, I was thinking, are they going to do the Thrawn trilogy for 789? Probably not, but, you know, it's interesting to think about, and, you know, it's kind of like when Marvel got picked up by Disney. A lot of people were thinking, oh my god, it's going to ruin Marvel, and not really, it's just kind of, they, Disney just kind of wants a piece of the pie, and they make good movies, uh, typically, so, um, I think we need possibly get something good out of this. I don't know. I'll be interested in, in Episode 7 to see what they do. I hope they don't bring back the original cast with uh, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and, and Harrison Ford. I think that could just be sad. I would like want them to just do a completely different thing in the same universe um, and, and see what goes from there. But, uh, yeah, it, it could be interesting. And, you know, as for George, I'm, I think it's really cool that he took that $4 billion and put it in, into an educational program or whatever it was that he did. I think that's really cool. So good for you, George. But uh, as far as this, I'm not upset about it. That's basically my point. And uh, hopefully my friend is wrong and George Lucas is not dying. But, you know, we'll see. One thing that people have to keep in mind when it comes to guys like Kurt Hennig and Rick Rude, who were very talented and certainly had the ability to be World Heavyweight Champion and could carry main event matches. I mean, people forget how good Rick Rude really was. I mean, that guy was top-notch talent and could work well with just about anybody. And, you know, Kurt Hennig, people sing his praises all the time. Fantastic worker, great character, great on the mic, great everything. And Rick Rude had all the great presentation, the great character, great mic work, and everything else as well. Um, the problem was, and what probably kept them out of the main event, is that they were sharing the spotlight with some larger-than-life characters. Guys like Hogan, guys like Piper, who never got the belt, and that's a crime. Piper should have gotten the belt. Uh, guys like Savage, guys like Andre, guys like DiBiase, who's another one that should have gotten the belt and didn't. Um, <clears throat> it was just an era that was populated by these great larger-than-life characters. Even Warrior, say what you will about the Ultimate Warrior, but he was one of them too. Uh, then you go into WCW, you've got Ric Flair, you've got Sting, you've got Vader. And, it, you know, it's really hard to spread the wealth of, you know, guys like Rude and Hennig, who are very talented, very good at what they do. Are they really, like, the larger-than-life personalities? Yeah, that's hard to say, but they are fantastic workers. And they worked so well in the mid-card that it was kind of like, you know, they carved a pretty good niche for themselves in that. I mean, to me, the Intercontinental title, that was perfect spell. Uh, that to me was like, that was his spot, that was his belt. And for years I kind of looked at it as anybody carrying the Intercontinental title is just carrying Perfect's belt. And Rick Rude was a fantastic United States champion uh, for WCW in the early 90s. Uh, he worked great as Intercontinental champion as well. Got, you know, the first good things that the Warrior ever did were with Rick Rude. Um, and they could definitely get the best out of anybody they were working with. And they could work with those larger than life characters. I mean, Perfect did some great stuff with Hogan. I remember when he uh, smashed uh, Hogan's uh, title belt to, you know, to smithereens. I mean, that was great. Uh, you know, they were certainly great talents and get the best out of anybody they were working with. It's just the fact that they were sharing the spotlight with uh, a bunch of these larger-than-life icons that kind of defined the era, and that kind of left them uh, in the mid-card spot, which isn't a bad thing, because I think a lot of people... Especially nowadays, they kind of look at the mid-card as you're stuck in the mid-card when, you know, I mean, you can carve a pretty good living for yourself in the mid-card and make it mean something and make it awesome. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, uh, when I was a teenager, I was a big fan of D'Lo Brown, and he was a European title guy, and I loved him in that spot. And, you know, you move him up to have him work with guys like Austin Rock and, uh, you know, the 
Shawn Michaels and the Triple H's and guys like that, he's probably going to get lost in the shuffle. But you keep him at the European title level, and that opens up all these other doors of what you can do with him creatively and all these different guys that he can work with. So uh, I, I, I think, and I, I definitely think that Hennig and Rude were better than D'Lo Brown, but um, they were just kind of stuck in that same type of position where they were, uh, you know, just two very talented guys sharing the spotlight with some larger than life icons. And they carved nice livings for themselves in the mid-card and, you know, had, as it turned out, Hall of Fame careers. So, uh, good for them. Uh, but I definitely think they had the ability to carry main event matches. That's certainly true. It's just, uh, you know, maybe Perfect could have been world champion in, like, 93-94. Uh, when, you know, guys like Hogan were gone and Savage was moving out of the way and things like that. But, uh... You, you know, because that's when guys like Brett and Sean were starting to take over. And, um... I don't know. It, it, it's 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 interesting. Um, like I said, they definitely had the ability. I just don't think it was like the timing wasn't there because of who they were sharing the spotlight with. I would say it depends on how big the roster is. Uh, you look at WCW when they were at their height, you know, 97, 98, and their roster was just fucking humongous. They had the world title, they had the U.S. title, they had TV title, cruiserweight title, tag team titles. That's five belts spread out among so many different guys that I would say that works just fine. I, I think, you know, um, the deeper your roster is, uh, you know, you probably gives you more leeway to have more championships, but the cruiserweight division was totally uh, deep. The tag team division, maybe they struggled because they broke up too many teams, but uh, they always found guys to compete for the tag titles. Uh and then, you know, the heavyweight rankings, they had, the heavyweight rankings were big enough to have three levels, world, U.S., TV, and it worked just fine. Um, now you look at the WWE, currently they've got two world titles, uh, the IC in the U.S., two mid-card titles, uh, with no clear distinction between them, so you just kind of have to assume that they're at the same level. And uh, then they've got the tag titles and the women's title. Women's title, that's fine. Tag titles, you know, now that they've reinvigorated it, it's fine. Uh, for a couple years, I actually advocated just getting rid of the tag division and, uh, you know, starting from scratch later. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it really is weird because you've got the WWE title, which is kind of the top. And uh, then you've got the world title, which is supposed to be on the same level, but it's really not. So that's really more the second tier. And then you've got the IC and US, and, you know, bullshit. Uh, you know, which one is bigger? I don't know. There's no clear-cut ranking, and it just makes it feel like the title scene is too cluttered. So, like I've said, you know, get rid of the world title and get rid of either... Probably get rid of the US title, because the IC title has more history with the company. And you'd probably be in a better position, especially since the WWE, their roster is nowhere near as big as WCW's was back then, and just doesn't really warrant having that many belts. And then you look at TNA, it's kind of the same thing. Is their roster really big enough? Uh, their knockouts roster is definitely not big enough to have tag titles. That's like the most useless championship I've ever seen, so scrap those, definitely. Um, you know, X and tag titles, definitely fine. They can definitely bolster those rosters a little bit more. But uh, overall, you know, it's fine to have those division-specific titles. Um, uh, but then you have the world title and the TV title, and they've never really done a good job of, like, making the TV title, like, that perfect number two belt. It really, it feels more like a number three belt, and there's nothing in between, which is really kind of strange. But, um, you know, drop the knockouts tag titles, and they'd probably be fine, and, you know, just reestablish the other belt. So I'd, I'd say, I, I guess the rough number is around five. Uh, would be fine with some division specific titles thrown in um, but it's it's very easy to make you know your title situation seem very cluttered if you have too many titles and not enough guys uh, to fight for them I remember when the ECW title was in the mix and it was just a uh, fucking egg. and there were two sets of tag titles that was even more fucked up and I remember during the invasion angle where they had two sets of everything because of WCW being thrown in and thank God they didn't throw in the ECW titles as well because that would have been way too confusing but um, yeah, yeah, it is very easy to screw that up, but I'd say roughly, you know, again, it depends on how big the roster is, but five seems to be the number to go with. Uh, he wasn't one of my favorites. I, I, you know, a lot of people say he's the greatest intercontinental champion of all time just because of the rain. Uh, you know, to me, that's the part that's not real. Uh, you know, yeah, he held the belt the longest because the bookers told him he was gonna, you know, they made it that way. Um, do I think he deserved it? Um, he got heat. 
Um, certainly, and I didn't hate his reign. I, I think, uh, the, you know, it was very basic booking where they just created this really hated guy that always snuck away with the belt at the skin of his teeth, and he was, he was more of a comedy character, uh, which, again, was fine. I actually kind of had the idea when they brought in Simon Dean, and, of course, they jobbed him out horribly, but I always had kind of had the idea. It's like, you know, he could have been the modern-day honky-tonk man. Just give him the IC title and let him run with it, and let him be kind of the same thing where he's this comedy heel that, that you know, everybody hates, and, uh... They, they, they could have gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Um, you know, but again, you know, as far as ranking him among the other Intercontinental Champions, I don't think he's as good as Savage or Perfect or Valentine or uh, Sean or The Rock or Orton in 2004 or, you know, a lot of, like, the best of the best when it comes to Intercontinental Champions. But I enjoyed his reign. It had a great payoff with the Warrior beating him in 30 seconds. I thought that was really cool, actually. So... Um, you know, it, it was a good reign, great payoff, solid character. It, it was good all around, but not one of my favorites. I hate them both, because where I live, a lot of stores don't carry paper bags for environmental reasons. And also for environmental reasons, uh, we get taxed for using plastic bags. Which is... Thank you, Montgomery County, Maryland... Let's find out. Let's see. Uh... Boxers. Well, apparently they're putting the motions in the place to actually do it. I, I think it, you know, their method of actually doing it kind of sucks. It's almost like they want to have the success of the Avengers without putting in the work. I mean, Marvel Studios built up the Avengers movie for four years, basically, and did each individual hero Quite well, I might add. I did enjoy every single Avengers movie, you know, singular hero movie leading into the Avengers. Um, Justice League movie, I mean, they'd have to, you know, if they did it from scratch, I mean, Green Lantern they'd have to do again because the movie sucked. Uh, Superman, I'm still not sure of how that's going to turn out. This, this last trailer was pretty good, to be fair. Um, hopefully that turns out well. They're going to have to reboot Batman because uh, the Nolan Batman won't fit in with the Justice League. Uh, they've never done Wonder Woman, never done Flash, never done, uh, you know, Martian Manhunter or Hawkeye, or Hawkman, not Hawkeye, um, Aquaman they've never done, uh, you know, there's, so there's a lot of heroes that they've never done in the JLA individually in their own movies, and I don't have a whole lot of faith <laughs> that they can do them right. It's like, okay, do Superman right, and then maybe I'll start to kind of sort of trust you with a JLA movie, but we'll see. I was when I was a kid because I was, you know, always afraid that I was going to get kidnapped by a pedophile because, you know, that's where they get you in public restrooms. Uh, yeah, it wasn't it great that I watched Unsolved Mysteries at six years old. God damn. Um, but nowadays, now that I'm an adult, it's like, I don't, I don't give a shit. You know, I mean, fuck. So somebody watches me from the urinal. I mean, there's nothing on me that's not in a biology textbook. Fuck off. I don't give a shit. Well, they're going with General Zod, which I'm fine with. Uh, you know, the great memorable villain from Superman 2. And uh, someone familiar, but we haven't seen in a long time. So I I'm fine with General Zod. But if it were up to me, I probably would have gone along the lines of somebody that we've never seen in a movie. Like Brainiac, or Metallo, or Bizarro, or, you know, someone like that. Not Darkseid right off the bat, because I think you got to save him. Uh, but, um, yeah, I probably would have started off with somebody like that. Somebody that we have not seen in a movie, because there are a lot of Superman villains that have never been in a movie. I mean, this, you know, this is the sixth Superman movie, and all we've ever had is Lex Luthor, General Zod, and his cohorts. Um, a bunch of made-up bullshit in three. Uh, Nuclear Man in four, <laughs> who fucking sucked. And, you know... And that's it. I mean, we haven't had a whole lot of them. And I, I guess Toy Man can't work in a movie. I guess uh, the Mix Yes Spit Lick or whatever, however the fuck you pronounce his name. I, he probably wouldn't work in a movie, even though I love that guy. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of Superman villains that would work. Doomsday's one uh, that, that probably, again, they probably couldn't do him right off the bat. But, uh, you, you know, I, I would have been thinking along the lines of Metallo or Brainiac. Uh, but, uh, you know, General Zod is fine. I have no problem with that.
With the exception of Lazenby, I liked pretty much every actor that played James Bond. I, I liked them all for one reason or another, and I think they all brought something different to the role. But my favorite, you got to go with the original. I love Sean Connery, uh, mainly because it's a level of performance that you can't see anymore because of how un-PC it is. He is just straight up alpha male. And that's what he is. He's just fucking pimp. He walks in. I own this shit. I own these bitches. They're mine. I will spank every girl in this room on the ass, whether they like it or not. I, he's a bit of a chauvinist, but you got to love it. He's just, he is the alpha male. Like, you know, what man doesn't want to be the Sean Connery James Bond? I mean, I mean come on. He's fucking awesome. Um, and just for the fact that Sean Connery has so much natural charisma and so much natural presence and just owns the role. He just owns it. And then, you know, throw on the fact that it's it's the type of performance that we can never, ever see again. It's just more, that makes it even more classic and makes it stand out even more. So, I, I love Sean Connery. Um, fuck no. Overall, I don't think very highly of the pre-Nolan uh, Batman movies. I did like the first one, the Tim Burton uh, 89 film. I love that one, actually. I love the style. I love uh, love the visuals. I love the characters. I, I, Michael Keaton is still my favorite Batman. And I still love Na Jack Nicholson as the Joker, although I do feel like Ledger surpassed him. Um, I, I do really like that one. I think that one is great. And I, I think I've said this before. That movie changed my perception of Batman. Because all I ever had before that was the Adam West show. Which I love uh, for comedic reasons. And yes, I do love the Adam West Batman movie. I, I, that movie is so wildly entertaining. It's just, it's glorious. It's a masterpiece. Um, but, you know, this movie changed my perception of Batman. And I did think of him as more of a dark, uh, and atmospheric, uh, stoic type of character. Um, so the first movie's great. Batman Returns is kind of a mess. Uh, I think the story's a mess, you know, who's aligned with who and who's after who, and the direction of the story keeps changing, and it's just a fucking, uh, just too much shit going on, especially towards the end. And, uh, I also think this is the one where Tim Burton, they kind of let the mad dog off his leash a little bit, and it got a little too weird in certain parts, like, what the fuck was up with Catwoman, you know... Being brought back to life by cats, what's up with the penguin being a sewer demon, what's up with, uh, you know, all these weird images. It was just a weird movie, and, and I uh, I didn't really click with it that well. That said, I did love Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. To me, she's still the definitive Catwoman. I just, I loved her in the role, but uh, I, I just felt like Batman Returns was too much of a mess. Um, Batman Forever has some good ideas. Schumacher style is horrible. And this is the thing I never understood about the Schumacher movies. Each one is two villains. Well, three if you count Bane, but he was just a muscle head in, the th in uh, Batman and Robin. But, okay, you've got Riddler and Two-Face in one movie, and you've got Mr. Freeze and Poison Ivy in the other movie. In both movies, they treat one villain as established, and they give a backstory and an origin uh, to the other one. Uh, and uh, actually, the origin of the other villain is part of the movie. Okay, now, between Riddler and Two-Face, who is the more interesting backstory? Most of you would probably say Two-Face. Which villain gets the origin in the movie? And who's already established? Two-Face is already established. Riddler gets the origin. Doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, n not that I hate the Riddler. I just think that Two-Face has a far more interesting uh, origin and creation story than the Riddler does. Um, and then Batman and Robin, they did the same thing. Mr. Freeze has a way better backstory, uh, especially after the animated series really uh, rewrote <laughs> rewrote history there with, with that wonderful Heart of Ice episode that they made. Um, Mr. Freeze has a far better backstory than Poison Ivy does. Who's treated as already established and who gets uh, you know the origin in, the, in her movie? Poison Ivy gets the origin and Mr. Freeze is already established. I don't know how that happened, but okay. Um, but yeah, Batman Forever, like I said, has a few good ideas and, you know, how Batman deals with being Batman and deals with having a partner and everything. But overall, it's just way too kiddy and way too colorful and way too just weird uh, for me to really accept it. Uh, Batman and Robin, uh, more of the same, only even worse. <laughs> I can, I kind of look back on this movie and laugh at it. I can look at this movie and kind of laugh at it now, but it's such a disaster. There are so many bad parts of this movie that people forget. Like Bane, uh, you know, walking around placing bombs, and he's just going, bomb, bomb. People forget about that part. That's how wildly stupid this movie is, and it is just so stupid and so just... 
just so bad the ice puns if i hear one more ice pun i'm gonna chuck something at the television i just oh god that that movie is just so just frighteningly awful and poison ivy uma thurman god bless her she, she's channeling may west with that performance <laughs> it, is, it is just so fucking bad um but yeah so the pre-nolan batman movies and i don't think the nolan batman movies are perfect like the dark knight is the only one i would say that i love i, I think it's just a fantastic movie uh you know be begins and rises have their falls you know their faults uh but they're overall pretty good the pre-nolan films uh, the only one i liked was the first one uh, the rest can kind of go to hell i i've only watched but i've watched the 89 film dozens and dozens of times and the other three films i c i can probably say i've seen them less than five or six times between all three films combined so you know, uh, not, not a very good stretch of Batman films during the 90s, no. Oh god, this could be a whole video onto itself. My, jeez, uh, so many bad ones. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the really goofy cartoony ones, like some of the ones that WCW did, like the Chamber of Horrors, where guy, Abdullah the Butcher got, had to be electrocuted in the chair. Uh, they also did the, I forget the name of it, it was like the Doomsday Tower of Doom or, or something like that. I God, I don't remember the name of it. That might be the TNA name. I don't... I don't know. It was like the Tower of Doom or something where it was Hogan and Savage versus like eight guys and and they kind of went through the structure that was... Try to imagine Legends of the Hidden Temple but without any of the decorations. It was just like... It was just a steel mesh cage and it didn't look like a temple but it was kind of the same thing where they're going from room to room beating up two extra guys and it, it that was a mess. One of the stupidest matches I've ever watched. Um... One that TNA did that nobody remembers, and I think uh, they probably don't remember it because it was in 2004 during the weekly pay-per-view era and it just kind of faded away, but uh, the Luck of the Irish match. Um, yeah, that match makes no sense. <laughs> it's kind of Basically, the point of the match is that it was uh, Glenn Gilberti versus uh, Pat Kenny, and the point of the match is, is that... Uh, there's a key attached to a football. It might have been a rugby ball. I don't remember. I, I really just... I'm trying to block this out. Uh, but it, it just... It stays there, for, you know. And uh, there's a key attached to a rugby ball or a football. I don't remember what. And the key will unlock all four of these uh, foot lockers in each corner of the ring. And one of the boxes will have weapons in it. And you have to guess which box has the weapons for you to use. Now, my question is, why are they going around opening up all the boxes? Just pick the box up and shake it, and you'll see which one has weapons in it. It's not that difficult. I don't know why. <laughs> it was so stupid. And you just know that the last box they check is going to be the one that has the weapons in it. So it was just a just a really stupid goddamn match. And, uh, you know, they, TNA also had a few other ones, like... Uh, the black tie brawl and chain, you know, half tuxedo match, half chain match. It's, okay, how are you supposed to rip the guy's tuxedo off if you're linked at the wrist? It's going to be really hard to rip the shirts off. I'm just just throwing that out there. Um, that was a dumb one. Um, and now some of the ones that WWE did that were stupid. Uh, the crybaby match, loser has to wear a diaper. That's kind of childish. The hog pen match was stupid, which they actually brought that back. Like, that's how I knew, like, the WWE was in trouble, because things like the hog pen match were things that people made fun of about mid-90s WWF before they made the turn to the Attitude Era. And then, here we are, I think it was, what, 2007, 2008, and they're going back to the hog pen match. I'm like, dude, what the... <laughs> Come on! Um, so, yeah, I hated that. And one that I just absolutely despise... And I think might be number one on my list of, like, the worst gimmick matches ever. And nobody ever talks about it. The Concrete Crit match. Oh, my fucking God. That thing was so stupid. And it's just so mind-numbingly insulting in how stupid it was. Um, I mean, it was Undertaker versus the Dudley Boys with Paul Heyman. And he had Paul Bearer hooked up to a device that was going to drown him in cement. If the Undertaker didn't do what he told him to do. And I... It, I don't know what the fuck. It just... Oh, my God. So, apparently, the WWE sanctioned attempted murder. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. 
Um, and Paul uh, Paul Heyman, who's normally great, was wildly annoying in this match where he just kept yelling at Undertaker and yelling, Bad dog! Bad dog! Bad dog! And uh, filling up the, the fucking box with cement and, uh, you know, it, it was just so stupid. It was just so just wildly unentertaining and just insanely stupid. And I heard an interview, a shoot interview with the Dudley Boys where uh, they said that when they walked back through the curtain after that match was over, um, Undertaker turned to them and said, you know, boys, I think we were ribbed. <laughs> I mean, what else do you say to something like this? It was just so, it was so stupid. And it, I don't think it gets enough credit for being, like, one of the worst things ever. I, I don't think it has a spot on WrestleCrap. I could be wrong. I think it deserves one. It was actually featured on an Undertaker DVD anthology not too long ago, and I'm like... Why do you want people to remember this match? It is so fucking awful. And it was a pay-per-view main event, which made it even worse. It was, it was so fucking bad. It was, um... I don't know. It's one of those matches that's just so wildly terrible, and I think it deserves to be recognized as such, and it, it often gets overlooked. I think it's the worst match of Undertaker's career, quite honestly, but, it, I mean, wow. That's, I'm glad that that's never made a comeback. Thank heavens. Worst titles ever. Uh, a lot of the ones that bug me are the ones that kind of spread the divisions too thin. Um, like the Knockouts tag team titles do. It's like, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea if they had like 20 knockouts or even like, you know, 20 or 30 knockouts, but they don't. So there's no real reason to have it. Uh, um, you know, things like the Cruiserweight tag team titles in WCW kind of felt the same way. It's like, you know, not a bad idea, but I don't know if the roster's deep enough to really support you know, cruiserweight tag teams, um, you know, and you're basically dividing the tag division into two as well by doing that. Um, actually, the WWF, nobody remembers this, but they had women's tag team titles too, uh, and basically the whole division was the Jumping Bomb Angels and the Glamour Girls. They had good matches. I mean, the Jumping Bomb Angels were amazing. I know nobody remembers them, but uh, it was basically, that was their whole quote-unquote women's tag team division. Um, I, I only saw them wrestle twice, so it, they probably didn't even matter, but... Uh, <clears throat> You know, a lot of belts like that that just spread the rosters too thin uh, that really bother me. Uh, the hardcore title during the 24-7 rule era got mind-numbingly annoying. Um, it, it worked going into WrestleMania 2000. They got a lot of comedy out of it, and it was funny. But then after, they didn't know when to kill the joke. And it just went on and on and on. And every week, you know, guys were getting pinned left and right and becoming the new hardcore champion. And there were like 847 title changes. And when there's that many title changes, you know, you just stop caring after a while. And, and you know, who cares who the hardcore champion is at this point? Um, and it just, you know, it, that was something that died a horrible death. And, you know, it's funny. I hear a lot of people calling for a return to the hardcore title. I'm like, I, I'd probably be open to it, but um, in addition to having to scrap some other titles first, they also, I hope they don't bring back the 24-7 rule because that, no. I mean, they pounded that into the fucking ground, and uh, we don't need that back. Um, and also, uh, belts that, you know, shouldn't exist, like uh, a second world title. Like, the World Heavyweight title to me is like, just get rid of it. It, it doesn't need to exist. Uh... You know, a lot of situations like that, but those to me are, are kind of the worst championships. And whenever they go, like when the Knockouts tag titles eventually do go, which I can't imagine WWE or TNA keeping them around much longer, you know, I'm not going to miss them. So, uh, yeah. I think Chris Hero is a very talented guy, and if I were going to bring him into the WWE, you know, my idea was to reform the kings of wrestling. I mean, yeah, it's not Claudio Castagnoli that he's going by Antonio Cesaro, and the, I don't know if they're going to give Chris Hero a new name or anything. Uh, I think they'd probably be tempted to give him a superhero gimmick but <laughs> uh, with a name like that, but uh, I would, you know, bring them together and reform the kings of wrestling and kind of let them be the staple, the crown jewel of the, this newly revived tag team division. That's probably what I would do, but... Um, I, I don't know how they would use him if they brought him in. Um, you know, obviously I, they'd probably be tempted to go the superhero route or maybe they'd be, uh, you know, put him in the shield or something. I, I don't know. Uh, he's talented enough to get a shot. I, I know that for a fact. So, you know, best of luck to him. Hopefully he does show up in the, in the WWE one day. Hey, if they can get away with the Cobra, they can get away with anything.
Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, Undertaker and Kane, John Cena and Randy Orton, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels. There you go. You know, it, it's kind of hard not to believe in sports curses when you see some of the things that have happened to the Detroit Lions and the Cleveland Browns and teams like that. I mean, you, you watch teams like that and you just go, man, God must hate you. Most overrated player in NFL history, I gotta go with, and this is nothing against the Jets, I really, I know I'm a Giants fan, but I really don't have anything personal against the Jets, but I, I, Joe Namath, uh, the guy wasn't that good. I mean, you know, he's famous for the Super Bowl, he's, uh, you know, famous for his, you know, celebrity off the field, but when you look at his statistics and you look at how well he played and you look at the amount of success he had after the Super Bowl, or lack thereof, you know, he really wasn't that good. Um, you know, he just had his day in the sun and that was it. But because he was a star and he was Broadway Joe and everything, um, he kind of gets treated like football royalty. And quite honestly, he I, I don't think he was that good. When people say, you know, the, you know, they debate now, should Eli Manning, you know, has he had a Hall of Fame career yet or whatever? And I'm like, well... Joe Namath is in the Hall of Fame. I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, you know, I believe he threw more interceptions than he threw touchdown passes in his career, which is kind of telling. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that Joe Namath is, you know, uh, as great as everybody says he is. But everybody remembers him because he's Joe Namath. Um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of his media stuff and the stuff off the field and obviously the one Super Bowl. But uh, other than that, you know, he, he wasn't that great. A most overrated coach. I like the guy. I really do. Uh, but Tony Dungy, when he was with the Indianapolis Colts, uh, he's a good coach. But when you have Peyton Manning running your offense, half the job is done for you. <laughs> so, I mean, that's basically, when you have Peyton Manning as your quarterback, you basically also have him as your offensive coordinator. I mean, that is like, you, you do not have to worry about your offense, uh, for the most part, if you have Peyton Manning under center. Um, it's kind of like being the punter for the Colts when, <laughs> when Peyton Manning was playing. It's like, I mean, wow, that's a really cushy job, I, I can imagine. So, uh, you know, I like Tony Dungy, but, I mean, that job wasn't too hard. Uh, <laughs> you know, being the head coach of a team with Peyton Manning as quarterback. Most overrated team of all time. That's a little tougher. Um, it's really hard to say. I can't think of too many teams that won the Super Bowl and didn't deserve it. Um, you know, uh, God, it's really hard to say. Um, I'm going to say that they've kind of become one of those quote unquote like juggernaut teams. And not this season, obviously, but um, they've kind of been you know, viewed as this unstoppable, juggernaut, you know, hard-to-beat kind of team. And I don't think the New Orleans Saints in, in this recent, you know, five- or six-year stretch, even though they've whooped up on us pretty good, except for this last time, um, I, I don't think they're that good. Uh, and they're, they're great at home. Like, when you watch them play at home, uh, it's like the 07 Patriots. They look unbeatable a lot of the times. But... Then, when you get them on the road, they don't... You can see dents in the armor. Uh, I remember when they lost to the St. Louis Rams uh, in a game that people were picking them to win by 60 points. <laughs> Seriously, people were throwing around uh, that they were going to win that game by 60 points, and the Rams beat them. Um, I remember they went on the road in the playoffs against a 7-9 team in the Seattle Seahawks and got trounced. Uh, last year, they should have beaten the 49ers. On the, if they were as good as people say they are, they would have won that game. And Alex Smith made them look like fools. <laughs> you know, um, it's just they—they they don't seem to be as good on the road as they are at home. And I think that is, uh, yeah. But people kind of view them as being unstoppable, whether they're on the road or they're at home. And and I don't think that's the case. I think when you get them on the road, you see a lot of the vulnerabilities, and they're just—they're just not as good on, on the road. I guess. A lot of teams aren't as good on the road, but they don't look like the same team when they're playing on the road. And uh, even in their good years, even in their Super Bowl year. And uh, I, I've always kind of felt that way about them, and, you know, no one else really wants to say it. Um, but, you know, whatever. Easy answer here. Most underrated player is Jim Kelly. Most underrated coach is Marv Levy. And most underrated team is the Buffalo Bills. 
uh, that they coached and played for uh, during that stretch in the 90s where they went to four Super Bowls in a row. People kind of look down on them because they lost four Super Bowls in a row. But I'm thinking, you know, a team that good, that talented, to make it to four Super Bowls in a row, that's pretty damn good. It's just, you know, uh, going back to the, uh, the earlier question about sports curses, I'm like, you want to talk about a team that's cursed, fucking Buffalo Bills, uh, to lose in some of the ways that they did uh, was, was pretty remarkable, and they still find amazing ways to lose games. Um, but that team was very good, and Jim Kelly was a very good Hall of Fame caliber quarterback. Marv Levy was an excellent coach. Uh, you know, and they had a lot of other, uh, you know, offensive and defensive weapons to make those teams as good as they were. And it's just, you know, it's kind of a shame that, because they should have won at least one of those. Uh, actually, the one that they should have won was uh, the one where they played the Giants. Wide right! But uh, we, we, um,. We outsmarted them and, and snuck away with the win on that one. Uh, not that I'm unhappy about that. You know, I'm glad that we won that one. But, you know, you know the, the other three, it's like it's kind of a shame. It's like, man, uh, they, they should have won at least one of those. But, you know, it is what it is. A very good coach, very good player, very good team. It's just just wasn't in the cards to win it all, unfortunately.